I want to talk about uh, just, just sort of an introduction, an overview. I want to talk about uh, complex systems and, and big data. So, uh, and all of the talks coming after me will, will reinforce these things. So, we've seen repeatedly these transitions in sciences where they've gone from data scarce to data rich. And, uh, you know, we could look at physics, for example. Now we have something like the Super Hadron Collider, 10, 20, 30 terabytes a second, most of which is thrown away because they claim they know which bits they need. But the truth is they can't store all of those things. So, I mean, we have this super abundance of data. We have more data coming in than we can possibly, uh, you know, store. Uh, astronomy has transitioned really only recently, around about 2000. Went from uh, a game where you would, uh, as a graduate student, go out and, and get your week or two on a, on a telescope, and if it was cloudy, your thesis would be about clouds and how pretty they are. Um, and and now, it's, now it's just unbelievable amounts of data coming in. Every five to 10 years is a big transition for astronomy in particular, where the orders of magnitude of more data come in. So the game changes, the way you think about the way you approach these sciences changes. And, and there's some resilience to this. People do like the hypothesis-driven approach to science where somehow you walk into the room with your theory of, of things fully formulated. You're not allowed to do anything before you do that, right? You just have to somehow know what's going to happen. Of course, we pretend that we knew what was going to happen in papers over and over again. We say, well, here was our theory, and we, we showed it. So, but with, with these really data-rich worlds of, of science, there's, there's a whole, new, you know, there's a new way to approach things, which is simply you have to go and look for patterns. You have to find the shapes in, in, in these massive data sets. And then all of the rest of our scientific approach is still there, right? We start to ask questions. We realize which questions we should be asking. Right? And if we're honest about it, we say, well, we just looked around and found some shapes. If we're not quite, we'll say, this is the question we had at the start. Um, it's an incredibly exciting time. And uh, it's, it's, you, you see the rise of people who will call themselves a, a data scientist. And actually, during my PhD, I remember getting very excited about data, but being a little embarrassed about that. You know, that, that wasn't right. You're supposed to have a theory. Uh, but it seemed to me there was just all this data lying around, and you just had to look at it. And so that's become more and more acceptable. And now we have people who will say, I'm a, I'm a data scientist. You know, I'm proud. <laughs> Uh, I can't help myself, you know, it's just the way I am, right? <laughs> so, complex systems, uh, and, and these, so there are systems all around us, we're part of them, economic systems, uh, geophysical systems, financial systems, social systems, uh, and, and the, you know, so a very simple definition would be very distributed systems where there's no uh, powerful central control. Right? So there are lots of localized interactions giving rise to uh, macroscopic behavior. And, and often the macroscopic behavior is you know, disastrous, like a, uh, 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 crashes in, in, uh, you know, in the stock market or ecosystem crashes. They're the ones that tend to wake us up. Uh, this is a hot dog, <laughs> but it's also a collateralized debt obligation, in my mind. So uh, both of those things contain parts that you possibly wouldn't want to uh, touch by themselves, um, even look at. But someone very cleverly has put all of these mortgages together and said it's AAA. And, and you say, OK, I'll have two or three million of those. Thank you very much. And um, put some mustard on the side or whatever the financial equivalent would be. Uh, and, and so these are, these are elements then of, of systems that, that recently have gone awry, particularly in the US, uh, and, and for reasons we don't entirely understand. Uh, so there's an obesity ep epidemic, but in principle, this is a great thing, right? It looks good, it's kind of nice looking, it's got a nice shape, it's an emergent phenomena. There are all these uh, little uh, odd pieces in here, but somehow we get this nice round thing out at the end. Um, uh, <coughs> but the ingredients have mattered, right? So the ingredients have mattered, uh, and I, you know, there's another step in here to go back. There's the, the, the emergence of, of structure in complex systems. We see this over and over again, and it's, it's nice to reflect. So there's no, there's no uh, hurricane in a water molecule. There's no uh, hot dog in a, in a sodium atom. Um, you, you don't, there's, there's, that shape just isn't in there, right? There isn't a financial collapse inside a dollar bill. 
it's all of how these things arise. And, and for, us, for us, we talk about DNA and genes. We understand our atoms, if you will, now. Uh, it's not obvious that, that a, a strand of DNA will produce whatever it does, if it's a human or a, you know, a jellyfish. OK. So, uh, so there, is, there are compelling reasons to understand systems. And, and the reason we haven't been able to do so for things like social systems and economic systems is because we haven't been able to describe them. Right? So describing is, is the, uh, the, the, uh, the great problem that we've had with these much more complicated ones. So in some sense, physics is, is the easiest science. Right? And we often call it the hard, it's a hard science, but it's sort of a soft science where we've been able to get at that stuff. And I can say that because I'm physics. Um, but it, it was the stuff we could get at more easily because it turns out the stories of physics are equations. And these are things we can write down with pencil and paper. They're the stories. They're hard, raw stories. When you get to life, suddenly algorithms start to appear. And I would call these the most primitive algorithms we have. We think of algorithms as computer algorithms, but um, algorithms appear uh, with the start of life. And that becomes harder to describe. And so we have this, uh, uh, the, the advent of computers, the web, massive computational power gives us two things. The ability to store all this data and instrumentation on top of it the ability to store this data and to simulate and model and, and, and do things that we, you know, we never were able to do when we were back in the pencil and paper stage. So social sciences, for example, amazing transitions now. The data that's coming in is, is really astonishing. And it forces us, again, to ask different kinds of questions. Not even to ask questions, perhaps, to find out what the questions should be. I uh, wanted to add one more slide here. So this is just some uh, version of where people are online. And there are enormous numbers of people with cell phones. There are enormous numbers of people uh, you know, interacting on Facebook and, and through Twitter and so on. Mostly doing very you know, normal things. Uh, but the, the word I want to use here is socio-technical computation. And uh, I've just talked about computation writ large and how it allows us to simulate and model I think there's a big avenue going forward. We've seen some of this, of, of this idea of socio-technical computation. So this is people and computers connected in all sorts of interesting ways. The, uh, the, the brand would be Hunch and Crunch. I'll give you that one. That's a rhyme. Um, I like playing Crunch, but Hunch and Crunch rhymes, so we'll take that. So, uh, so Google, actually, is a great example of, of this kind of phenomenon. You might not think. You might think Google is a cold algorithm working on data, and we just let it loose. But its success, and if you were alive when, uh, when Google first appeared, you would have been playing with things like Excite and Lycos, and, which were pretty terrible. They, they didn't work very well. And, and if you, the first time you used Google, it was absolutely magic. The first, it, it, it worked. And it's because people made meaningful links. The web was made out of meaningful links, essentially much more back at that time. Now we have crazy linking going on, uh, trying to trick Google. But, uh, it absolutely depended on the fact that people had made an enormous number of meaningful links between sites. So there you had this people plus computers at an enormous scale solving a really difficult search problem. I and mean, that's an amazingly, amazingly hard search problem. And, and uh, you know, we tend to think of it as just an algorithm that's just a computer algorithm. But it's definitely absolutely social in, 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 in many respects. And more recently in, in uh, in uh, sciences, we've seen something like Fold It, for example, which is the protein folding game, right? We like to play games. We're good at playing. Uh, we have crazy intuitions that computers simply can't do. Um, uh, you know, you have photos of pic pictures of things. Computers have a hard time, very hard time, looking at these. And we can just tell immediately. So artificial intelligence has a long way to go. So the protein folding story is, well, people can see the big moves that need to be made, and computers can do all this crunching in the background to get the thing working. So I think there's a, this is just, a, just an idea I want to leave with, that, um, that that's another huge avenue of computation that's opening up for us, and another way to solve these incredibly difficult problems that we need to solve, that we need to understand. And I'll finish with, I need to finish, I will finish with, uh, you know, the hypothesis for a big data science, for a big data world, is this is interesting. That's your hypothesis, right? And, and you can go out and find out if it's right or wrong. 